go. Hey, it's great to see you here as we gather together as God's people. The first Sunday in Advent, that means Christmas is coming. We're in Christmas time, and I hope you're all excited about that. Wow, okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. We can rely on the front rows here for this. No, it is, it's a great time. Um, we, and as we will rediscover in worship this morning, why we have this season to begin with, uh, what it means for us, and how it can just cut through the mustard of everything with uh, the commercialism and all of the season. So I'm glad that you're here. Uh, the uh, Stump the Pastor hymn sing is always a fun thing for us to do. Uh, there were 81 uh, responses or submissions, so we got a lot turned in. So there's plenty to choose from, but we only are able to have a limited amount of time with that. So just a very, very brief uh, run through, and that is, uh, first of all, with your insert on one side, you have the church's name and location, and then the events that are, are coming up. You will see that our midweek Advent begins this week at noon and 7.30 on Wednesday. Uh, that is in the gathering place this coming Saturday is Breakfast at the Manger. This is an event that we have been doing for quite a number of years. Uh, we have crafts and uh, food, hence breakfast at the manger. It's a great experience. So if you know of any kids, neighborhood kids, folks who are part of the church, and then those who um, aren't or have no church home, they're invited to be part of this. It's always a lot of fun. And next Sunday is the Christmas pageant, our children's Christmas pageant during this service, the 1030 service. So we look forward to that as well. On the back of that insert, you will see about our community garden which is located across from the north parking lot there on Washington Street. This gives you an update of uh, with the kids who go to the Goaty building and or uh, kids who are part of the juvenile court system. And this is uh, a joint project and venture we've been involved with for a few years now. This gives you an update of how that's uh, really coming along. It's a very exciting ministry that we get to partake and be part of. So please take the time to look at that. Also then, just to uh, catch you up to date on a few things, uh, we are still having the card shower for Milo Wyant, who's turning 99, okay? So if you're feeling achy and a little stiff, just think uh, 99, wow. So, you know, this is great, uh, so please keep uh, Milo in your prayers, but also uh, send him a birthday card, wishing him a happy birthday. Bread and Bowl is gonna be a week from Friday on the 15th, if you would like to supply that, or physically help out with that, uh, please make note, all the information is there for you. Uh, this is Terry Glossett right here and her sister Kelly. So actually we got three sisters here in a row. It's, this is a very dangerous pew. Pray for this pew, they really need your prayers, they just do. So, but uh, they're gonna be leading Bread and Bowl a week from Friday, so if you would like to help out with them, talk to them after worship, or at least um, uh, provide some food and all that. Um, two more things. One, on page seven, oodles and oodles and noodles. We have 153 to go. Next Sunday is our deadline. We always meet or exceed the goal that Salvation Army gives us. So we're almost there. But if we can have a final push and surge going into this week, it would be really appreciated. And a final note at the bottom of the back cover of your bulletin, and that is with the um, set of elf, and elf, yeah, for elf on the shelf, we have uh, the holy couple of Mary and Joseph. A few people have found them. They are not in the sanctuary, but down that way. Am I right, Marilyn? Okay. I looked around the gathering area, the gathering place. I couldn't find them, but rumor has it they're around there. Oh, high up on the hillside. That's the clue. So if you want to hang around after worship and try to find Mary and Joseph on their journey to Bethlehem, they are high on the hill somewhere that direction. So uh, take a look-see. It's a lot of fun. That's a new, new fun thing we're able to, to experience this year just to have a good time as we enter into Advent. So um, the uh, Advent wreath, as we see. Kevin, thank you for doing so. We have uh, the first candle, the candle of hope. And it's a reminder to us that Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, brings hope to the world as well. And so our first Advent candle, and for this week, it is the week of hope. 
Now, today is our Stump the Pastor Christmas, Advent Christmas Hymn Sing. We have been doing this for quite some time now. The last two Sundays, we have asked for you to um, submit on a piece of paper some selections. We've had 81 submitted, so quite a bit this year. So the way this works is we have our world-famous pickle jar, and 81 of those hymn numbers are in here, 81 pieces of paper. And we will go like section by section of, of our seating pattern, and I will ask a person to uh, pick one uh, from the jar, and then we will sing one or two verses, then I give a mini message about that, and then we will go and select another one, and that's how it works. So we will start with Elaine, if you would, please. Hymn 276, 276, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. And we will, that's a two verse, all right. So it's two verses, we will sing the first and last verse. <laughs> Infant holy, infant lowly, for his bed a cattle soul, oxen lowing, little lowing, Christ the child is born of all, swiftly winging, angels singing, bells on for sleep. Infant holy, infant lowly. Uh, Jesus was not just any ordinary boy. As we see in, uh, throughout church history and in the scriptures, we have what's called the incarnation in the flesh. That Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, that he is fully human, but also fully divine. He is infant holy, fully divine, and also infant lowly, fully human. And when we see these words at the very end on the last stanza, Christ the child, Lord of all, and Christ the child born for you. Christmas is for the whole world, for the whole cosmos. But Christmas is also for you. Christ was born for you. What a scene this had to have been. When we look in the Gospel of Luke, after the angels had uh, departed from visiting the shepherds, the shepherds said, well, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And it continues, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger, a feeding trough. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. A few things we learned from that, first of all, is the shepherds told people what had been shared with them from the angels. Now, this is a role model for you and for me. The good news wasn't just meant for us to stay in here, but to share that with other people as well. When you turn on the news, when you get on social media and all this, there's a lot of bad news out there. And it's easy for us to just moan and groan and gripe and complain about it. But then we are also confronted with the Christmas story of what, what difference are you going to make? That as the hands and feet of Jesus, how are you going to help hope come into the world? 
and in people's lives. And so you and I have been given this great gift to share. It's not something that we've got to do. It's something that we get to do. And it's the news about this little baby who was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger for the salvation of all the world. It's a beautiful message that people so desperately need today. And you and I have been entrusted with that message to share it with others. Infant holy, infant lowly. Let's see. Hey, Chloe, you wanna, wanna choose one? If you could pass that down, please. What do we have? 272. Hymn 272. Let's see what we got with 272. Ah. Let's do one verse of this one. Lo, how a rose are blooming. Uh, it's the first verse. You may think, why are we talking about flowers at Christmas and they're not poinsettias? It's a rose. We'll find out. is quite a, a desert kind of place in most areas. I mean, it's rather arid, brown, a lot of rocks and a lot of dirt. And to think about a rose blooming in the midst of that type of setting is quite a powerful statement to make. Now, why a rose and why write a hymn about that? The prophet Isaiah, of which we have a lot foretold about the coming Messiah, in the 35th chapter, the prophet writes, verses, um, verse 1 and 2, The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the rose, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. I think what Isaiah is trying to, to share with us in that passage and understanding, how many of you like roses, by the way? You know, all right, you know, and some of you, like on special occasions, would love to receive a rose. Um, they are a beautiful flower. They have a wonderful fragrance. But the rose is, when you see a flower bloom in spite of its surroundings, it really does make a statement. And so, with the good news of Christ, when there is a person, and perhaps it's yourself, who is hurting and needing of hope, who is having a tough time, and to have a message blossom before you and with you and in you like a rose is an incredible experience to have. To know that even though the grass withers and even though flowers fade, as Isaiah says, the word of the Lord stands forever. Christmas is a time of once again being reminded of this baby boy who came to be the salvation of all of creation, who came to help you discover or rediscover again for the first time what it is to be a child of God, what it is to live a life of hope, what it is to have peace with God and others and 
yourself, to have peace with yourself. He came that we may have life and have it abundantly. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It is now time for Noah's Park Children's Church. begin with the prayer of illumination. Before reading from the Bible, we seek the illumination of the Holy Spirit that we become receptive to the life-giving word which comes to us through both the reading and proclamation of Scripture. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, as the Scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. O oh, look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. Let's join um, in reading responsibly Psalm 80. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. Restore us, O God, make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. Restore us, God Almighty, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, 
with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you from firm, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the God, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. good news of the Holy Gospel for you, God's people, as it is written in the Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus teaches us, but in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great glory and power. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone. Watch. Word of God, word of life. Praise to you, o Christ. And please be seated. One thing I forgot to mention in our announcements is with uh, communion today, because of the Christmas trees up front, typically we would have communion in the round on the first Sunday. We're not able to do that, so traditionally what we do in Advent on the first Sunday, we just have continuous communion like we do on the third Sunday. Uh, we will need two communion ministers to help uh, with communion today, so whatever folks uh, would be able to be willing, two and not three. Okay. Let's see, who do we got here? <laughs> Jody, how about you? If you would pick one for us, please. 288, hymn 288. D, what do we have? Good Christian friends rejoice. Okay, the first and the last verse of 288. First and last verse.
not fear the grave Jesus Christ was born to save. It's one of the neat things about the Christian faith is Jesus turned the dead end street of death into the highway to heaven. That is his grace and that is his mercy that he made possible, not only through his birth and his life, but also his death on the cross and then his resurrection from the tomb. So that is sort of the, the full gamut there. And so someday he will return again as victorious Lord of all. As we say in our communion liturgy, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. But good Christian friends, rejoice. What do we have to rejoice about? Not only what I just said, but also about who this one is that is being born. Do you realize that Christmas is one big birthday party bash? It is. All these songs that we're singing, these are birthday songs for Jesus. I mean, we have the, the candles. Sometimes uh, we'll have cake or maybe figgy pudding or, um, oh yeah, we have cake, all right, fruit cake. Yes, yes, fruit cake. How many of you put candles in fruit cake? How many of you use fruit cake as a doorstop or, or something else? But it is. That's what Christmas is. I mean, we do funky things for Jesus, don't we? Stop and think about it. Other parts of the world must think, my gosh, these Christians are weird. They take a tree and they put it in their house for a month. Okay? I mean, you know, they, they hang stinky stockings by a, by a fireplace. I mean, there's a lot of uh, peculiar things that we do at Christmas, but then our faith is peculiar as well. I've shared this story with some of you before. When I was a frat brat, when I was at a fraternity, a uh, brother, a Sigma Nu, at uh, Wittenberg University, my faith was not really developed to where I felt I could share something. Uh, you know, that's bad on me. One of my fraternity brothers, Greg Klima, was a self-proclaimed atheist. And he was uh, standing outside of, of the, the frat house talking to someone else, I can't remember who it was. And as I was walking out, it, I was not part of the conversation, this was not brought up because of my presence, but the thing was that he was saying in this exchange with the other person, he goes, in, in so many words, can you believe these Christians? How dumb is it? They think that this baby boy is God and that he's the savior of the world. Now, if I had known better and had been more uh, assertive at that point in my life, I would have said, Greg, you understand it better than most people. It is the unbelievable, absurd, ridiculous, weird thing that everyone is invited to believe. That yes, indeed, this little baby boy is more than just any other little baby boy. Because he is not only the son of David, son of man, he's also the son of God. That in this manger, in this feeding trough, in this dirty, smelly location, we have the Holy One who is born, who made such a difference that when you think about it, time, world history, is sent. he is the hinge point of all of this. B.C., A.D., I mean, all of these things. Yeah, Greg, you understand this perhaps even better than most Christians do, and you're an atheist. I would love to have shared that with him. But he understood it. He didn't necessarily believe it, but up here, he got it. And so what else is it about this baby boy that we have to rejoice and to be so thankful and glad about? The prophet Isaiah he shares these words in chapter 9, starting with verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, and Counselor, and Mighty God, and Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. For Crystal and I, when our son was born, it was one of the most glorious times in our life, but it pales in comparison to what Christmas is truly all about. And for that reason, folks, you and I, no matter what stuff we're working through right now, 
that is a reason to rejoice and give thanks to God for this little bambino of Bethlehem. Okay, we got one more and then the creed. Let's see. Bum, 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 bum. Mm -hmm. Calvin. Okay, thank you. 292, hymn 292. Love has come. Let's do verse 1 and 3. Love has come. First and last verse. needs now is love sweet love and it, I can't remember who first originally sung that song if that was Burt Backrack or one of the old timers there but love has come God is love we read in the first letter of John and in the fourth chapter it says dear friends let us love one another for love comes from God everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Love has come. And how can we say that? Again, Jesus is God in the flesh, God in a bod. So when people ask, what is your God like? All you have to do is tell them, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and look at Jesus. Look what he teaches. Look how he lives. Look how he interacts with everybody, because there you see God walking on the face of the earth, God taking footsteps in his creation. And so as we hear every Christmas Eve, also from John, the very beginning of his gospel, in which he says this, in the beginning was the Word, Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. For him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of people. And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. And this very same word became flesh. There is the Christmas story. And made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And we dare say love. Because God is love, and Jesus is God in the flesh. Love has come, and we rejoice in God's beautiful, beautiful message to us. I invite you to turn to page eight. In other words, the back of your bulletin. Uh, we need to stretch our legs. Let us please stand as we proclaim our faith in the words of the Christmas Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who sent his Son as my Savior on Christmas Day. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, announced by the angels, worshiped by the shepherds, adored by the wise men, who lived to suffer, die, and rise again. 
to free us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who has brought me to faith in the Christ of Christmas, and by whose continuous work in my heart I am ever led to lay before the feet of Christ the treasures of my love and live under him as my king, both now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Madison, if you would, please. Thank you. 259, hymn 259, 259. Ah, fling wide the door. Uh, let's, for time's sake, let's just do the first verse. Fling wide the door, great Advent hymn. <laughs> One of the common themes throughout the Bible is doors, or you could argue gates. Uh, when we think about the Garden of Eden, and when Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, it was shut to them once they had left. When you think about Noah's Ark and the, the door finally being shut and the floods came. When you think about the city of Jerusalem, all the different gates that were part of that great city and still are. Jesus in his ministry says, I am the gate, the door of the sheep in which I let my sheep go in and go out and find pasture. And then we also see in the book of Revelation in chapter 22, I believe it is, 20, 21 or 22, towards the end there, ah, I think it's 22, in which the, uh, the city God, the new Jerusalem, at, no, it's 21, and uh, how with the city God, the new Jerusalem. Look it up for yourself. You'll find it there. But in, in the, the, the holy city, as it is descended from the heavens, and, and we see how the gate, the door to the new Jerusalem, in other words, heaven, is never closed. But it's always open. The opposite of the Garden of Eden. Because what you see is God's restoration project culminating in the final chapters of Revelation, in which with Eden it was shut, and now the restoration of paradise, the doors are yet once again open, made possible, as we see in this little one born in Bethlehem. What a beautiful, great message and gift entrusted to us. Okay, we got one more then? Mm -hmm. Caroline, if you would, please. Oops, thank you. Hymn 239. Hymn 239. Hark the glad sound. Okay, this is one of the chart toppers that we always sing, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> there are always those Christmas hymns and, and those Advent hymns that we just aren't always familiar with. So we're going to get familiar with this one. Let's just do one verse of this. Hark the glad sound. Hark the glad sound of our Savior. 
nice one, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty easy to learn. I like that. I like that. Well, the Savior promised long. One of the things perhaps that we can unfortunately miss or overlook during Advent, which Advent season again is we are preparing and preparing for the birth, the coming birth of the Christ child. But Advent also has that other theme to it, and that is as we are waiting and preparing for his second Advent, his second coming. As we say, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. But one of the great things about Christmas and about Advent is the understanding that Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah or Christ, needed to come from the house and lineage of David. Now, when you look at the opening chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, you have this uh, genealogical flow chart or pedigree chart, as some people will, would call it, beginning with Abraham and all the way. There's a few generations that are missing in it, but Matthew has a point to that. When it finally gets down to Joseph, you know, Joseph and Mary, and then Jesus. This is a little bit of a peculiar thing because, wait a minute, Jesus is not the biological son of Joseph because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And so when Mary comes to Joseph and the whole contract of this is, we would call it engagement. But this is a two-year process in ancient Israel. And it's a fairly binding contract in the exchanging of, of money and property and all these type of things. Joseph was recognized as a righteous man, which means he was a man's man. Men looked up to him because he followed God's law and therefore he was considered to be righteous. He was one of those role models of manhood and of faith that other men looked up to and wanted to follow. Mary, when she announces to Joseph, a oh, honey, I know we're engaged and you need to know that I'm pregnant. And even though you and I haven't done anything, um, oh, by the way, this is the son of God that I've been entrusted to to carry around for nine months. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were Joseph, I would be thinking, good grief, what in the world is going on with her? And so what Joseph decides to do to protect Mary, because literally to have child out of wedlock, she legally could be taken to the edge of town and a group of men would come together, pick up rocks and stone her to death and it would be okay. He decides, I wanna protect her, I wanna keep her safe, but me, to follow God's law, I will not marry her, and this is how things are going to be. And so he does what he, he's getting ready to do what he can to protect Mary, preserve her reputation, and to also follow what he believes is God's will for his life. He is then visited by an angel, which literally means messenger. Joseph is visited by an angel, and we are filled in with this scene in which after he had considered, okay, divorcing or breaking off uh, this with Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. He's now hearing this from an angel of God, a messenger, that Mary was not off her rocker after all, but what she was telling was the truth. And she will give birth to a son, and you, Joseph, are to give him the name Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus, which literally means Savior. He will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. This is from Isaiah chapter 7. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, which we knew Joseph would do. If it was a message from God, he would obey it. And took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Whew. Tell you, with the Christmas story, when you start digging into that deeper, there's a lot of beautiful, great, neat stuff. But as you go deeper into the story, it gets a little complicated, and there's a lot more to it than what really meets the eye. Joseph was an incredible fellow, and he was a role model of the faith for Jesus from the time he was born on up. Let us give thanks for Joseph, and let us give thanks for men who invest in the lives of their kids and that of others as well.
It is time for our intercessory prayers in the peace. And so I invite you to please stand at this time. And let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord Jesus, you are Emmanuel, God with us. You are indeed wonderful and counselor and mighty God, Father of eternity and Prince of Peace. You are the good shepherd and guardian of our souls. You are worthy of our trust, Lord. And so we pray and lift up to you, Jaron Meyer and Cora Kowalski, Joel Parker, Sean and Kim Kimmett, Carter Burner, Eileen Madaw, Donna Goodwin, Lee Linton, Tim Tomlinson, Cindy Speakman, Patty Poling, Shirley Litmer, A.G. Wiseman, Stacy Corday, and Kathy Botzell. We lift up to you and pray, Lord, for our upcoming breakfast at the manger, for the leaders of our country, as we pray for peace as well in the Holy Land. So may your word feed us and your spirit lead us into the week and into the life to come. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share the peace of our God with those around you. We now turn to page 107, and please stand. Uh, page 107 in the front of our hymnals, as we now prepare to uh, celebrate and partake of the Sacrament of Holy Communion. A reminder that our offering boxes to continue our ministry locally, nationally, and globally. Those offering boxes are at both exits. We can also give electronically by going to our church website or texting 419-273-9947. We turn to page 107 in the front of our hymnals and let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world. Signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to Christ. We turn to page 109. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We turn to page 112. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Please be seated. If you are partaking of Pew Communion, I invite you to get out your communion kits at this time. In the body of Christ given for you the blood of Christ shed for you. Well, we have one more selection before we go today. Let's see. <laughs> Barbie?
278. Hymn 278. <laughs> what do we have, Dee? Away in a manger, but not the one we usually sing. Okay. The, um, it's the traditional but non-traditional version of Away in a Manger. It's the British one. Okay. So how many verses are in there? Three. Let's do all. Well, let's do one and three because we're past time. So one and three. Way in a manger. Seven verses, the Christmas story. For in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem in the town of David, because he belonged to the house and lineage of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, away in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. I invite you to please stand. As we now begin our Advent journey, this pilgrimage through this most sacred season, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. The doxology. Mm -hmm. Praise God. 